You are listening to the podcast of the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. We report on the leading role that new technologies play in the context of the global information society, interviewing academics and industry leaders. Okay, uh, we do a little podcast with Avri Doria and Elvin Davis. Um, Avri Doria is a free consultant with uh, lots of experience in internet architecture design in the widest sense, and so is Elvin Davis. We just had a workshop on the future, future internet architecture, and I thought we'd speak a bit about uh, what uh, we got out of this workshop. Um, the last point we discussed was um, the way the architecture might or may not change in the future. Um, Avri, um, give your prediction what you think, uh, where are we heading to? Well, actually, as I said in the paper, I don't know exactly where we're heading to, though I, don't, I do know that it will change. There are various things that, that will change it that will make the policy discussions we have now less critical, less what we have to talk about. What I do know, or what I do believe, is that it will change in small increments, but at the end of a decade, um, it'll look different than it is now. Elvin, do you expect any revolutionary, uh, disruptive changes? In a sense, from the point of view of people who use the internet, there will probably be something that looks quite disruptive. There will be changes, Pe people will invent new ideas, and, and it is quite possible, given our experience over the last 150 years, that somebody will come up with a very good idea which will actually significantly change the, the way that the internet works and how it is used. Can you give me a concrete example? Where would you expect changes? Where would I expect changes? I think that the, the changes certainly will be about the, it, the, the internet will become ever more embedded in our lives. We've seen that over the last 15 years the information economy has become critical to, to our lives and certainly those of us who work with the internet find now that we're, we're addicts. We, ca we, we can't avoid using it. We, we, we get very itchy when we don't have access to the internet. That doesn't need a, uh, that wouldn't require a change in the architecture. That would just mean uh, more and more people use it for more and more things. But how would that impact the architecture? I think the answer to that is who knows. Um, <laughs> the, there are certainly going to be many more devices that are going to be accessing the internet. Um, we are already at the state where there are probably more devices accessing, accessing the internet than there are people on the earth. Um, and each individual person on the earth, well, I doubt that everybody will be in, in contact, or everybody will want to be in contact in 25 years, but certainly the internet will have spread a lot. And a lot of our devices are going to be network connected, network enabled, so that there will be a lot more data, and we will have considerable difficulties if we don't have good ways of, of accessing that data and knowing it and categorizing it and looking after it. I mean, if you think about the way that, uh, that, that, that books are handled today, the indexing of books and, and being able to access and, 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 and organize those books and being able to, to find the information in those books is critical to their being useful. And if we can't index the information and know about the information, you know, hopefully in perhaps a better way than it is at the moment with uh, Google, which basically goes around and, and, and tries to find all the information and fails with quite a lot of it. Um, it, the information will not be useful to us. We need, we need to be able to index it. And I think that's possibly somewhere where we may have a, a revolution, that, that somebody finding a good way to actually keep track of all the information and you being able to use that information in a way that is, is, is better than it is today. I know that, for example, that, that people's ability to find information is very variable. And it has been the case that there has been a, a concentration 
of uh, of the number of sites that are actually used. So Google is is used a, a, a lot to find things, and there are a very small number of sites that people use to find information. If you and and it's often found in a very rudimentary fashion. There's, there's a lot more to do. So uh, the Internet of Things, that is sort of a, a recent catch word that tries to capture some of what you've mentioned. Avri, what do you think how that will uh, impact uh, the Internet architecture? Okay, two things. One, one is the Internet of Things is another one of those overlay networks. So I think that in terms of that, it will change some of the external features of the network. I actually don't know that it'll change the architecture of the network, but then again, I'm not really sure I know what you mean by the architecture. If you mean, as I was expressing in the paper, will it change the principles on which the Internet is created, I don't think it'll change them a lot. Will it change some of the artifacts, some of the addressing methods, some of the search methods, some of the how things are controlled, who has authority, who hasn't, is the authority distributed or not? Uh, yes, it will change those. In fact, one of the aberrations we have in a network architecture at the moment is in terms of a distributed architecture, we have a single focus of a naming architecture. So I think that, in fact, that will do something to fix that and bring the naming architecture more within the actual architecture of the Internet, making it more distributed in terms of how autonomous is a system and yet still able to cooperate, how the authority is distributed for naming and such, for addressing and such. So I think the architecture will actually deepen will actually become more mature, but I'm not sure that what I consider fundamental to the architecture will actually change its instantiation, it's the way it looks, the way it's deployed, I do believe will change. And if you think of new ways of naming things on the Internet, is that related to what people mean by the Internet of Things, namely um, attaching sensors to objects and make them interact? Um, well, not, they don't necessarily attach sensors to objects. Sometimes they just attach things that can be sensed to objects. Um, but no, that's one of the things that falls out of the Internet of Things. What falls out of the Internet of Things when you have something that follows an artifact from its creation to, to, its, to its destruction it's going to pass through many different authorities. It's not going to have a consistent name. It's not going to have a consistent address. It's not going to, all the properties that relate to that are going to be different, yet they're going to be related. And the, that, 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 that object, that entity, will come under many different authorities at different times, and they will all have different methods for naming and identifying it, yet those things will be linked in some sense. So it's a complexity to that. And so is that the Internet of Things? No, the Internet of Things is for me to follow my steak from when it was a side of beef. On them. And they all have their own identifying features, and they all have their identifications, and those are all owned and controlled by different things. Yet you're going to have people that want to sort of have a coherent picture of what a particular person has at a particular time, and then there's the privacy issues with that. And so it makes a much more complex naming and authority control. But no, it's not about that. That's just one of the side effects of it. And certainly it's a challenge when you think about the lifetime of an object which, which goes through several ownerships. Um, one of the things that people would want to do is to make sure that um, the new owner can't find out much about the past life. Uh, the, the, the very simple things, you know, you, you, you have a, mm -hmm. a, a crate of paper towels that comes from the manufacturer um, and it, uh, it passes in a lorry through various places and goes to a supermarket and is sold and if, all, if, if that paper towel records its history um, and you have to also record its ownership, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. um, is the is the the thing that is attached to the paper towels going to have enough capacity to record 
its ownership but not record its history and how do you control all of that? That This is an immense problem which um, to actually get this right and actually be, to do something useful with it is going to be a very big challenge for the engineers and the technicians and the policy makers also to, to, to actually understand what is, what is needed in order to, to, to control this and yet make it useful. There's this popular phrase called uh, privacy by design. Do you think that's a useful way to look at this problem? And would it affect, I mean, could we imagine that as a component of the Internet? If you mean privacy by design is design privacy considerations in from the beginning, I think it's necessary. I think we've seen that in the discussions in Internet of Things, for example, and in other places, that you have to look at any of the technological things. For example, in, in technology, it's always useful to add an identifier. It's always useful to add perhaps a globally unique identifier or at least something that can. And yet, if you're looking at privacy issues, that is always a negative that can be used to, to identify things too closely. To, to abrogate privacy. And so you have to have those discussions right at the beginning of how can we solve the problem that needs to be solved technologically without <coughs> building in something that can be used to harm privacy. Because so often the things that governments and others use to, uh, to uh, abridge somebody's privacy are artifacts that were put in for a technological convenience. It was useful to do that, and so therefore it was done. But as soon as you put in something that identifies, that creates the history, and, and the history not necessarily created in the object, but in the sensors and the computers that talk to the sensors outside of it, once you've got something that can identify a life history, then, then you've got the ability to do something with it that is an abridgment of privacy then again, sometimes you want it. And this is that whole problem you have between the freedoms and the protections. If what you're following is medication and you want to be able to follow a bad batch of drugs, drugs. to the people that because they've been found to be from a bad batch, then you, and notice I didn't bring up stakes, uh, and, and then you want to be then you want to be able to track the history. So we both want to be able to track the history to protect us and we want to not uh, follow the history because we want to protect the freedom. So once again, we're in that tussle that says, "Make me free, but protect me, please." And we don't we don't want our medical insurers to know that we're using that drug. So there's you know that there's a two-way process that they, that mm -hmm. um, you want to be able to tell somebody who has that drug that they shouldn't use it anymore. But on the other hand. The fact that you've got it mustn't go back to somebody who might misuse the information to charge you more money because you've not told them that you're ill in that particular way. Um, so yes, there are big problems with that sort of thing, and the, the the thing that is always said in the technical world is that it's you should always design these things in from the start because if you don't do it, it will be incredibly difficult to retrofit it. But I wonder what that actually means to sign it in from the start if it's so contradictory what we want from it. How can that be designed in? Does it just mean that the user um, controls what to do about certain data? Ultimately, you, you've got to think very carefully about the requirements and that means that, that you, you may find that some of these things don't happen as rapidly as, as you would uh, maybe have expected them to do because the cost is great, the amount of effort that's in, involved in, in designing it correctly um, is difficult and the, the risk on all of these things is that somebody will try to short circuit this on a few things and after that there will be a backlash against it. We've seen that time and time again that people have tried to short circuit these sorts of things and you then get a backlash mm -hmm. against it and, and, and the good effects that you might have had out of it are, are lost because people don't take the trouble to do it properly the first time. So, um, the, f the final aspect I, I'd like to bring up is uh, best effort. Somebody in the workshop missed uh, best effort as a design principle mentioned in your paper. 
And I think to the surprise of the audience, uh, your take on best effort was, oh, that was all, uh, never a design principle. And I think you confirmed that. Perhaps uh, you might explain that again, um, how you understand best effort, because lots of people think um, that it's more than a, a sort of... Um, that it's actually a good principle, best effort. That this is what uh, distinguished the internet uh, from t uh, the traditional telecom um, networks. In many ways, best effort was the best that could be achieved. Um, the, there certainly was intention to try and deliver the same sorts of stories that, that uh, the telephone companies were keen on and uh, if you think about the original purposes of the internet which were was the military um, yes the intention was that the you, the, uh, the data had to get through and it was the, the, the you know the best you could possibly attempt to but on the other hand um, it, the military is very keen on generals words getting through to the other end to be told to the soldiers because generals are important um, and if you know if the if the, if the grunt on the ground, uh, if his if his packet is dropped, so what? It turned out that the technology that we had available to us, um, and that we have used subsequently, actually was not very good at doing that prioritisation. Um, as a result, the general's words actually were treated much the same as the grunt's words, um, and in many cases they got dropped because there was a, a hole in the network somewhere. Um, and so best effort has become sort of enshrined as what we can do but that is really something to do with the the technology that sits at the bottom of all of this and queuing theory and, and, and the difficulty of actually knowing the value of the data that, that, that in, the, in the core of the network because you know how do you value one piece of data against another when they come from totally different sources um, and the, the other problem with this tends to be that, that we, we tend to turn value into money. So people will pay, in theory, for better quality. But unfortunately, you then get to the point where everybody pays for the same quality and it just comes to the best effort again, because they're all, they're all at the same level of quality, ultimately. So, but best effort as a principle is something that could disappear in the future. I don't think it was ever a principle. No. Um, I think, I mean, the types of service or quality of service or now quality of experience that people talk about have been the holy grails of Internet technology, just things that we've always failed at creating. I think that they have become confounded with the network neutrality issues where all of a sudden people want to use these kinds of techniques to give commercial advantage to one content supplier's information over another where they were really supposed to be things that I could move into a higher level of quality when I wanted to watch something on TV and was willing to pay a little bit extra to have my picture not be grainy and and so or it would work anyhow the problem is we've never succeeded in creating it the the the, the technologists have been working on quality of service forever now it should also be pointed out that there's always been somebody getting better uh, than best effort and that's for example the routers inside the network have always had their data marked for priority so the fact that the NADA network works is based upon some traffic being more equal than others Another myth uh, destructed just uh, easily thank you very much